by their ejection seats. Come with us and see what it takes to eject. From the earliest days of combat aircraft, a system was needed to escape a damaged aircraft. Toward the end of World War I, the first parachutes became available. Until this time, there had been no means to escape a burning aircraft. By the 1920s and 1930s, parachutes had become standard equipment on all combat aircraft. The pilot simply leaped from the aircraft and pulled the ripcord to release the parachute. The dogfights of World War II proved the necessity for life-saving parachutes. But in spite of the many successful cases of parachute escape, problems began to develop as aircraft speeds increased. Second World War, aircraft speeds started to get higher and higher, and a means was required to assist the pilot out of the aircraft in the event of an emergency. Up to World War II, it was quite reasonable to just jettison the aircraft canopy and jump over the side with a parachute. But as the speed gets higher, the wind blast holds you back in the cockpit, prevents you from bailing out, and also it delays you. It takes you more time to get out of the aeroplane. If the aeroplane's diving close to the ground, and that's when the biggest emergencies are, then um, the time taken to get out of the aeroplane can be absolutely vital. Even when the pilot managed to escape the cockpit, the high speed of the fighter plane posed another problem. It was very difficult for the pilot to avoid striking the tail. The escape problem continued to worsen as aircraft speeds continued to increase. In the autumn of 1944, Allied fighters began encountering these strange new German fighters with sleek, swept wings. They were the world's first jet and rocket fighters. The high speeds of the new jet aircraft made the pilot escape situation even worse. The Germans had begun to work on a solution, the ejection seat. The idea behind the ejection seat was to hurl the pilot out of the aircraft with enough speed that he would clear the tail. The seat we see here was being developed for the Messerschmitt 264 America bomber, a type which was not completed before the war's end. By the end of the war, the first primitive ejection seats were installed in the early jet fighters, such as the German Heinkel 162. Work on ejection seats had also begun in Britain and the United States in the final years of the war. One of the central problems in early ejection seat design was human engineering. Could a pilot withstand the tremendous gravitational shock of an ejection? Could he withstand the enormous wind forces? In England, the firm of Martin Baker pioneered the early seats. From an engineering point of view, ejection uh, the ejection seat was developed quite quickly um, and we were able to soon come up with the velocities and accelerations that we needed to clear an aircraft fin in a high-speed dive. The problem was that nobody knew what those accelerations would do to a man. Nobody had ever ejected and all the pundits, the doctors, everybody else got in on the act but nobody knew what would happen and so they looked for a volunteer who would actually ride this seat and the man who came forward was a chap called Benny Lynch. He was one of the company's uh, fitters. He was working on the bench. And in fact, he had helped to make the rig that he was now going to test. It's rather like making your own gallows. You know, he, this chap stepped forward to, to test this seat. Behind the ejection seat was a tubular ejection gun. This system consisted of a set of telescoping tubes which contained a small explosive charge. When activated, the charge fired the seat out of the aircraft. They were rough on the spine, as Benny Lynch would painfully discover. 
And what they found was happening was that the acceleration was being applied too quickly. The rate of rise or the rate at which the acceleration was applied was too quick. And what was happening was that the vertebra in the spine were banging together like boxcars in a train, all banging together and um, causing damage to the spinal column. Sir James Martin undertook a careful engineering study of the human spine. To avoid the hard shock of ejection, he devised a new system. Several small charges were fired instead of one large charge. So instead of getting one great big kick, we went to three progressive accelerations, which allowed the man's spine to compress without jarring the vertebrae together, causing spinal injury. Having done that, about this time, Benny Lynch had uh, recovered, and uh, who better to test it than the man who'd had the problem in the first place? And so Benny stepped forward very courageously once again and rode the seat up the rig, and eventually they achieved the right accelerations that were needed to clear the fin of an aeroplane. In the summer of 1946, the ejection seat program transitioned from ground tests to the real thing. Watch carefully as in the special rear cockpit, Lynch gets ready to fire himself out for the second time. As the seat leaves the plane, the stabilizing drogue preventing the seat turning over in the air opens and then pulls out the seat parachute. Normally, only the drogue is used. The parachute has been fitted solely to prevent damage to the seat during these tests. Now, in his own time, Lynch can free himself from the seat. Watch just below the white canopy and you will see Lynch's own parachute open as he falls clear. The success of the early Martin Baker ejection seats was being paralleled elsewhere. In August 1946, Sergeant Larry Lambert ejected from a U.S. Air Force P-61 fighter. The following year, the first successful test took place in the Soviet Union. Power. We'll be right back. By the late 1940s, all of the new jet fighter aircraft were being equipped with ejection seats. The new invention had come just in the nick of time. In 1950, war broke out in Korea. The Korean War was the first conflict where jet aircraft predominated and it was the first time that ejection seats were widely used in combat. American pilots flying the F-86 Sabre tangled with MiG-15 fighters flown by Chinese and Russian pilots. Tiger Lee, Tiger 2 here. I uh, got a couple of bogeys out there. One coming around at two levels. All right, your boy, I got him. The Korean War experience highlighted a number of problems in ejection seat design. The early seats were only designed to get the pilot out of the aircraft. Once ejected, the pilot had to free himself from the seat, leap forward and open his own parachute. But on ejection, many pilots were dazed or injured and couldn't get free of the seat. An automatic seat was needed. The absolute fundamental of ejection seat design is the shortest time between pulling the ejection handle and being on an open parachute. And everything else is really irrelevant. The most important thing is getting that parachute open. It's only when the man is safely hanging on the parachute that you can be confident that he's going to survive in an emergency situation. And so many, many engineering hours were spent in developing automatic mechanisms on the ejection seat which would not only eject the man from the aeroplane, not only deploy the drogues, but would then automatically separate him from the seat and deploy his parachute for him. Because this new ejection system helped the pilot escape from the seat, it made ejection at low altitude safer. This new generation of ejection seat was in service by the mid-1950s.
Increasing aircraft speed continued to be of concern to ejection seat designers. By the late 1950s, new combat aircraft were capable of breaking the speed of sound. The U.S. Air Force was worried whether the pilot could survive ejection in a conventional seat at these speeds. So work was begun on an encapsulated ejection seat for the new supersonic B-58 Hustler bomber. The B-58's Stanley capsule seat was built around a conventional ejection seat. But in addition, the system included a special ballistic shell to protect the pilot. Prior to ejection, the crewman would close up the capsule. This capsule offered the aircrew a high level of protection 